She comes to us with a background in the geosciences. She has a PhD from Stanford, an undergraduate background at Princeton University. I would say just for the Wyoming audience, she did a lot of her research along the Bighorn, uh, the Bighorns on the dry side of the Bighorns near Shell, investigating the origins of the Rocky Mountains. So we're, this morning we're looking at the origins and maybe the current situation in U.S.-German relations. So I'm trying it in, Kate. <laughs> Um, and and we're, we're so pleased to have you. We're so glad you came up from Texas A&M to join us as provost. Please help me welcome the provost for UW. Well, I have to say, uh, I'm really happy to see such a, a, a great crowd here uh, for Ambassador Vidic's talk. Um, especially after I got up this morning and my, my, my Texas dogs wouldn't go outside. I thought, I thought it wasn't going to be a good start to the day, so, but I was wrong. So it is my pleasure uh, to welcome His Excellency Dr. Uh, Peter Vidich, Ambassador for the Federal Republic of Germany uh, to the United States, both to Laramie and the University of Wyoming. I'd also like to recognize his host and friend, Dr. Thomas Risa, where are you hiding? There he is. And, and Dr. Tanya Bertzel, professors of, where you, well, that was clever. Uh, <laughs> professors of political science at the Free University of Berlin, who also serve as senior fellows and on the advisory board for our Center of Global Studies and adjunct faculty with the Global and Area Studies programs here. We're, great, we're very grateful for their work at UW, um, which has also made Dr. Vidic's visit possible. Also, special thanks to the Center for Global Studies um, and the International Programs Office and Global and Area Studies Program and the Outreach School, who all pitched in to co-sponsor the ambassador's visit. Ambassador Vidic has served in his present role since 2014, and prior to this, he was the German ambassador to the United Nations in New York, as well as a member of the UN Security Council. Since joining the German Foreign Service in 1982, Ambassador Vidic has held ambassadorial posts in Lebanon and Cyprus, served at the embassy in Madrid, and as a private secretary to the foreign minister in Bonn. In, in addition to his German Foreign Service, Ambassador Vidic has an academic career that includes studies in history, political science and law at the University of Bonn and the University of Freiburg in Germany, as well as at Canterbury Christ Church University and the University of Oxford in England. He also taught as, as an assistant professor at the University of Freiburg. Dr. Vidic's address on a world in turmoil, the importance of the transatlantic partnership in the context of global crises is the opening keynote of UW's Germany Meets the United States program, which is funded by the German Campus Weeks federal grant program from the German embassy. Over the last three years, UW has received $20,000 to support the programming, which has included programming on the 25th anniversary of Germany's reunification and the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. This year's focus on German, Germany meets the US provides an excellent opening to the ambassador's address on the US-German transatlantic partnership. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Vidic. Provost Miller, uh, Jean Gerson, uh, thank you so much for your kind words of introduction. It's wonderful to be here and it is a great honor and tremendous pleasure to be guest at this uh, university here. Uh, thank you for the perfect organization of my program that started uh, yesterday evening. I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, my fellow countrymen, uh, Tanja Brötze and Thomas Ritze, Ritz, Risse, for enticing me uh, to, to come here. Um, and um, I see so many students, uh, welcome, and I'm looking forward to a spirited conversation with you and the other guests here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the most asked uh, question um, that I'm getting lately from Germans is not how are you, how are you doing, but um, who will be the next president, uh, Trump or Clinton? And even American audiences, uh, ask me that question once in a while. But I'm afraid I will have to disappoint you. Uh, well, it goes without saying that this is clearly the most uh, discussed and maybe the most important topic 
in this country, I will not be able to touch upon it, at least not in depth. But let me compensate you, however, with a reference to one of your former presidents. Um, and he might be less flashy, less glamorous than some of this year's candidates. But at least in Germany, he is one of the most popular, and especially in foreign policy circles, uh, one of the most renowned uh, presidents of recent years. President uh, George Bush Sr. shared his vision for the future of the relationship between Germany and uh, the United States back in 1990 after the fall of the wall and the reunification of Germany. And he said, building on the values we share, and he said this in an address to the German people, building on the values we share, we will be partners in leadership. At that decisive moment in history, the United States had stood by our side and helped to make our dream of freedom and unity a reality. I still think that this was one of the finest moments of American uh, diplomatic craft, of American statecraft, uh, of American statesmanship, to realize that the, those freedom movements in Eastern Europe and in Germany were unstoppable uh, that um, the American people and the American government would embrace them and shape and, and steer those freedom movement in the right direction. Uh, that was a great moment of uh, statecraft and a great moment of the American people. And the Germans remain uh, deeply grateful for the, report, for the support we received at that decisive moment in time. Looking back, from today in, in the fall of 2016 uh, to this moment, it's still amazing. The reunification of Germany went off without a single shot, without a hitch. No shot was fired, and it was an entirely peaceful revolution. And today, Germany is firmly embedded into the European Union and NATO and has become as a matter of fact, the economic powerhouse of Europe. So how did this happen? Germany had come out of the end of the Cold War as the winner, politically speaking. All of our neighbors, all of a sudden, were friends. And we have nine neighbors. But the ensuing uh, decade saw my country confront, confronted with many, many challenges, also economic challenges. In fact, as late as 1999, The Economist, the famous uh, weekly British journal, read on the uh, front page, Germany, the sick man of Europe. And it took 15 years, sometimes painful structural reforms in Germany um, had to be undertaken to turn things around. In fact, in 2014, this very same journal had entirely revised its view, now declaring Germany as the hegemon of Europe. It added a reluctant hegemon, but still the hegemon of Europe. <laughs> and last year, going uh, one step further, uh, Time magazine named uh, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel person of the year, largely due to the leadership role she had played facing the global challenges of the past years. So now in 2016, being partners in leadership is not as hard to imagine as it once seemed shortly after the fall of the wall and German reunification. But let me add, leadership <coughs> is what we need, but we need a partnership in leadership not only between the United States and Germany, but between the United States and Europe. And let me illustrate this call by looking at three major challenges in current world affairs that can only be tackled by Europe, Germany, and the United States together. The first challenge concerns Europe and the European Union. Europe is navigated 
turbulent waters, is navigating turbulent waters indeed. A Euro crisis, which was a kind of a, a Greek debt crisis, a refugee crisis of unprecedented magnitude, the rise of populist uh, political movements, and most recently, the decision by the British to leave the European Union. That sent shockwaves through all of Europe. Those crises leave analysts fearing for the cohesion, and in some cases, even for the existence of the European Union itself. First, let me make this clear. Brexit, the exit of the British people from the European Union, Brexit means Brexit. I can see no way backwards, and I think this decision can and will not be revoked. We, of course, as a government, as German people, mostly deplore that decision by the British people in that referendum, but of course we respect it. It was a close yet clear vote to leave the European Union. We stay close friends uh, with Britain. Uh, it's one of our most important trading partners and we know what the UK, Great Britain, has brought to the table of Europe. It's great tradition of a liberal democracy and so many other virtues. We also remain partners in NATO and the G7, the G20, um, and other fora. But our partnership will be different from the from, from the one we're having today. While the task of disentangling Great Britain from that set of rules and regulations that have developed over 40 years of membership of Great Britain in, in the European Union, while the task of disentangling that is daunting, there's also um, some serious soul searching going on in Europe after this referendum in, in Britain. We are thinking about our future in Europe. In a nutshell, we need to win back the confidence, the trust of our citizens. Yes, the EU must focus on the essential tasks that it can do together. Yes, it must not get down, get bogged down in regulating, sometimes over-regulating the life of its citizens. And yes, it must do better to deliver on the expectations of the citizens. But it must also do a better job in unmasking the reality behind all that populist rhetoric that has become so fashionable in some segments of, of Europe. The member states uh, of Europe must stop scapegoating the EU and Brussels for every misery in individual member states. And as a footnote, I think here uh, we are seeing a common phenomenon in this country and in Europe and in the West as a whole. The rise of populism in the Western world right now is a common threat, if you will, uh, exploiting the growing fear uh, in a globalized world and the global uncertainty. So, don't write off Europe too soon. All the remaining 27 member states of the European Union know what is at stake, and there are compelling reasons uh, why the European Union exists. Um, it is so important to realize that the European Union is the most successful peace project in the history of Europe. It has eradicated war and conflict for over 70 years on the European continent, at least in that part of Europe that is now forming the European Union. And it has brought unprecedented prosperity to all of Europe from Portugal to Estonia. Uh, and it, this is uh, a legacy, this is an asset that sh we should never lightly squander. And in that spirit, we are now um, getting back on track to refocus on the essential task of the European Union. Important areas include regaining growth and competi 
and competitiveness in the world economy, reducing youth unemployment, fighting terrorism, and protecting our external borders, and of course, coping with the refugee crisis. And I'm talking a little bit about that now. It's a, it has been an almost epic movement migration of people that we have been seeing. It has surprised us, frankly, that we've been seeing emanating from unstable states in the Middle East and in North Africa. And um, this has put a lot of strain on Europe and on, on my country in particular. Germany was one of the more open countries um, in, in that phase of um, the immigration and the, the, the flow of refugees. We have a very liberal asylum law, which is also a product of, of the Nazi regime, the Nazis who produced themselves so many refugees. Um, it was a lesson that our founding fathers of our constitution thought we had to learn. Uh, we have to, uh, and they stipulated the most liberal asylum law, um, I think in, in, in Europe, if not um, at least among, among uh, the countries in the world. So Germany accepted uh, last year in 2015 alone 1.1 1 .1 million refugees alone and if you put that in proportion it would be an equivalent of the US taking in 4.4 4 million um, refugees in one year. So, so that is a big challenge of course. The commitment to take in refugees to house and shelter them and to give them language training for example, also the enthusiasm in large part of the civil society um, is still strong and was very strong and still is strong, but um, there's also a growing skepticism in, in my country and uh, I think there's no uh, need to, to hide that uh, about the question whether we can absorb that many people coming in. And there's also um, a phenomenon of more vociferous voices of xenophobic segments of the society and we now have a new right-wing anti-immigration party that um, is trying to establish itself in the spectrum of political parties in Germany. So the challenge was and is to bring those uh, dramatic um, numbers of refugees and um, migrants down and the good news is it worked. Um, basically through one measure that was the most effective. Um, and that was a deal with Turkey. Turkey being the gateway uh, from Syria where the most of the refugees came from, Syria and Iraq, um, Turkey was key as an ally to bring the numbers down and it worked uh, with a difficult partner, uh, Turkey, um, the, the agreement that Chancellor Merkel uh, negotiated and it was then um, adapted by the European Union. So Turkey sealed off, controlled much better the border between Turkey and the maritime area between Turkey and Greece. And in return, uh, Turkey receives rather generous financial support for the refugees. And also um, the EU is willing to take refugees from Turkey into Europe uh, that have come in in a regular legal way, the philosophy behind that deal, of course, was to discourage this horrendous human trafficking that was going on in the Aegean Sea uh, between Turkey and Greece, and actually it has worked pretty well. Now the refugee numbers are down dramatically uh, from 10,000 a day that we got still in November to a single or double digit number today. I think one important fact um, I, I, that I want to highlight, there is no single lever to pull for us in Europe um, to deal with this uh, refugee crisis. We cannot just build a wall. Um, we, we, we are not in that privileged uh, geographic position that the US is in with two big oceans and just two neighbors, Canada and Mexico. Our country, as I said, has nine neighbors. And the freedom of movement in Europe is one of the essential things uh, of the European Union. We cannot just seal off our borders. We have to address uh, the sort of the complexity of the issue with various uh, measures. 
First is we have to keep um, the refugees in the region. We have to um, we, we have to uh, we, we have to support countries adjacent of of Syria and Iraq uh, that, that that look after the refugees: Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan. We have to strengthen our external borders. We have to separate refugees that really are fleeing a war or politically persecuted from the economic migrants, and we have to be able to repatriate some of the economic migrants, which we cannot offer jobs to all of them. And the most important thing is, of course, tackle the root cause. And the root cause in the case of Syria is that civil war and the instability there. So um, this is the challenge um, that we face. And in the end, it is a common European challenge. It requires also a great deal of European solidarity and burden sharing, which has been wanting in some cases. Ladies and gentlemen, no less uh, important to find a solution for peace and stability in Eastern Europe um, is the conflict uh, revolving around Ukraine. Basically, it's our relationship to Russia and the conflict uh, in Ukraine. And this is our second challenge. The Ukraine crisis is far from over. Firstly, Crimea illegally annexed, incorporated by Russia two years ago is still in occupied territory. And there's no end to this situation in sight but that must not lead us to acceptance or acknowledgement. Russia redrew the borders in Europe with that annexation, and that was and remains totally unacceptable. Secondly, the fighting in eastern Ukraine has diminished significantly, but it has not stopped entirely. And the situation in that region in eastern Ukraine, the Donbas region, is desperate. Thirdly, what is called the so-called Minsk Agreement, in which Chancellor Merkel played a leading role to bring this about. The Minsk Agreement, a detailed roadmap to a peaceful settlement of the conflict in eastern Ukraine that exists, it's still alive, but its implementation is experiencing too many obstacles. So Ukraine finds itself in a challenging time of transition and transformation. It deserves our assistance, especially economic assistance. Um, uh, assistance. We are the number one donor for Ukraine. But it's also clear that Ukraine has to do its own homework, create the right framework of rule of law for uh, the economy, um, do better in governance, and fight the corruption. Having said this, Russia bears the main responsibility for the situation in which the Ukraine find itself and the um, uh, feeling of threat in many countries of Eastern Europe. From everything we know and see, Russian policy and politics under Putin have not fundamentally changed. Americans and Europeans standing united have drawn red lines and given assurances to our European allies, who are, of course, rightly so, worried that Russia will also display aggressive behavior vis-a-vis -vis -vis Poland, the Baltic states, other Euro Eastern European states, all NATO members. Germany is taking a leading role in a broad set of military measures, including deploying multilateral forces in Eastern Europe to defend the inviolability of NATO territory. That is key. We are countering <coughs> Russian aggression in Ukraine with a strong sanctions regime that has been holding together, I would say also thanks to the strong and integrating voice of Chancellor Merkel. At the same time, we remain open to dialogue with Moscow and even to cooperation in areas where it seems necessary and where it seems in our interest. And here I name a couple of conflicts where Russia is playing, whether we like it or not, an important part. Ru uh, Syria, Iran, and the fight against terrorism. Our core message to Russia is this. 
We do not seek confrontation of any kind. We desire a true partnership and cooperation based on trust and achieve common goals. But there are limits and there are values that are not up for debate. And our determination to defend them is unwavering. Ladies and gentlemen, I come to the third major challenge, and that is the Middle East. The Middle East has never been a place where diplomats were sent for rest, relaxation, and cocktail parties. <laughs> I've been posted there myself. I was ambassador to Lebanon. I had an exciting time there and learned a lot. But politically, it has always been a particularly challenging uh, region, but in recent years, the Middle East has degenerated into the worst turmoil we have seen for decades. After the painful experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq, there has been much debate over whether the US should take a step back from the Middle East. I believe, however, both Europe and the United States need to be continuously engaged and American leadership in this region and beyond is still indispensable. Take the fight against the so-called Islamic State or ISIL. I believe no other country in the world would have been able to organize that coalition of more than 60 countries that is fighting with all um, different kind of measures, fighting um, this threat of terrorists um, emanating from the Islamic State. Germany is an active part of that coalition, politically and militarily. That is something new for us. Um, we are politically assisting the Iraqi government in Baghdad. We have done this for a long time, but we are also supporting militarily with lethal weapons, the Kurdish regions, the Kurdish security forces, the Persmerga in Iraq. And that is something new for us delivering weapons, lethal weapons, in a hot war zone outside the NATO. So we are also participating um, in that anti-ISIL coalition also with flights over Syria. We bring some experience to the table in, in helping to stabilize those fragile states in the Middle East and also in North Africa. And in some cases, there are even failing states. That is why we are working particularly hard in the anti-ISIL coalition to achieve long-term stabilization. Now, that is important, and we see that now in, with a recent attempt to organize a cessation of hostilities in Syria, uh, powered by uh, Foreign Minister uh, Secretary Kerry, together with his Russian counterpart, that we need to put already at this stage efforts in, in, stabilizing, in stabilizing regions that I either have been reconquered by the Islamic State or where we can harbor hope that uh, the war, the civil war, is, is subsiding. And that is important uh, to entice people um, to stay or to come back. So that is an important measure also to contain the immigration of people from the Middle East, uh, show them that they have a future there, support them with rehabilitating the infrastructure, um, rebuilding businesses, etc. cetera. Um, and, and that is what our main contribution is in that um, anti-ISIL uh, coalition. And it's a good investment also in containing uh, immigration. When it comes to another important country in the Middle East, in, in that region, Iran, um, we applauded and we were part of it, uh, the agreement on the nuclear program of Iran that was reached uh, last year. And now, uh, the reaching agreement was one thing, it was difficult enough. But ensuring strict implementation of the deal is just as challenging. And the deal is not about trust. It has been hotly debated in this country. Uh, you know and I know that. Uh, we've 
had many, many conversations on the Hill with skeptics of the deal, um, the European countries that were sitting at the table, France, Britain, and Germany, we defended it. But we also said, it's not about trust. It's all about verification and monitoring. And it's about a robust, uh, intrusive, and unprecedented monitoring regime. If Iran cheats, we will know it. And, it will, and we will have the tools to, to, at hand to take appropriate action if, uh, if, if it's absolutely necessary. And we are prepared to do so. And it's also evident that um, Iran plays a more constructive role, has to play a more constructive role in the region. We are not naive. It will not happen overnight. And we're very unhappy about their role in Yemen, in Syria, vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Uh, and let me be very clear at this point in time, the security of Israel for us uh, is never negotiable. We have a very special responsibility towards Israel. But we feel that the nuclear agreement is in all our long-term interest because it has a potential to open Iran up to the world and up to the West and strengthen those liberal forces in the country. 50% of Iran's population is younger than 30 years. Think about that. And they're all, most of them, are looking to the West and want to open up to the West. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as diverse as these uh, three challenges and crises are, they all share certain common characteristics. One is that they stem from the absence of value-based rule of law systems. They are a throwback to brutal power politics, or in the case of Syria, um, even worse, a descent into anarchy and chaos. The Middle East has experienced a, a, stunning, uh, a stunning resurgence of ethnic, religious, and tribal forces which are eroding the state-based order of the last century. Think about 1916 when two diplomats, Sykes and Pico, uh, redrew or drew the lines um, between the states. That was when the modern Middle East was created um, for the good or the bad. And 100 years later, that order has been upended. Uh, so those conflicts that we were talking about um, have their roots in the fragility of, of rules-based, value-based um, systems. A second shared characteristic is that they are the kind of complex crises that elude a clear-cut solution. To all of those crises, we don't have a magic wand. We cannot just send in the cavalry, so to speak, and expect them to save the day. Less and less can we, and I mean here the West, fully determine the results of policies in this fragmented, tumultuous Middle East. The extremely complex crises will require a multi-dimensional effort, political, diplomatic, economic, and yes, military. That will have to be sustained over a long period of time. And, and this is my most important conclusion, they will only be solved those crises if we, America and Europe, maintain our unity and act in a joint fashion. It is my firm conviction that this transatlantic alliance, based on shared values and aspirations, will carry us through, through today's storms. Uh, there will be disputes along the way, as we diplomats like to call it, frank and open discussions. But such discussions are part of a democratic, open set of societies that we are naturally, and they are also part of our alliance. So was Bush senior right after all? 
Are we united as partners in leadership? I would say probably not quite. Germany is already assuming a greater responsibility, but my personal view is it can and should do more on the international stage. Partnership in leadership also entails the other side, that is, a United States that is willing to act in concert with its allies, coordinating international engagement with its partners in Europe. There's certainly room to improve this partnership on both sides of the Atlantic. But, and this is the take home message after enumerating all this crisis and drawing a rather, I admit it, gloomy picture of today's global situation, we do understand that we need each other to solve today's global and multi-layered challenges and that our partnership is the best guarantee to a peaceful, stable, and prosperous world order. I thank you for your attention.